Well, I guess Horace isn't here yet. Driss, do you want to just get us started? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, Horace has good knowledge of I'll go some aspects. To show up. Yeah. Oh, that's not bad. Cool. Can you guys see this one? I'll take silence as a yes. Um, okay. So... <clears throat> Uh, there is an operator within PyTorch called SDPI. Can you zoom in, Driss? Yeah. yeah. Um, I can share this link too. Also, this is being live streamed. I saw you put the confidential marker on this doc. I don't think it's confidential though. Uh, yeah, I don't. Let me just like, yeah, there's actually, there's definitely nothing confidential in here. Okay, um, okay fix the label later. Yeah. Uh, cool. I'll do that later. Um, okay, so we have SDPA within PyTorch. Um, it is an operator. It powers, it's at the heart of every transformer model you ever heard of. Um, and it is, um, there's potential for it to be more flexible, I guess, is the gist of this. So um, some overview, like a very simple reference implementation of SDPA, you take in a query key and value, um, you do a matrix multiply of query and key, and that gets you something called scores. You do softmax, and then you multiply that by V. And this is like the most basic example of SDPA. Um, essentially, what we want to do and what users want to do is um, take your scores and you mutate it in some way. And then you use that as an input of softmax and you use that to calculate um, your final attention. Um, so some examples of well-known scores mod. So causal attention is can be thought about as a scores mod where you make the upper right triangular half of the matrix negative infinity. And so that with through softmax essentially makes it so you can't attend to anything um, after yourself in the sequence. Um, and two other very popular ones, which kind of was the gist behind this, this was alibi and uh, relative position encoding. Um, so that essentially alibi was the the thing that kicked all this off um, was how can we enable SDPA, the current one within core to uh, support alibi. Um, okay, so state of the world today. This is the current API. This is like the essentially native functions.yaml definition, uh, query key value, attention mask. And um, this is called attention mask. Maybe a better name would be attention bias. Um, but this currently acts as something, this is an additive score mod. So today it would be scores equals scores plus attention mask. Um, so that is a hard coded version of a score mod. Uh, dropout is causal. Um, this is like another good, interesting point. I mean, um, is causal can be encoded into the attention mask. Um, but for the fuse kernels, which is why this operator actually exists, um, it's better if you can signal it harder, you can save on essentially half the work and be much more performant. Um, okay. So, uh, I'm trying to think of like, should we motivate it more? Um, but essentially like we want to have a way to flexibly provide a score modification. Also, score modification, I'm still, I want to bike shed this name. I don't know if I like it that much. Um, but uh, flexibly provide a way to mutate the attention scores prior to softmax. Um, and in theory, almost every, I mean, from what I can tell, almost everything, if not everything, um, can be done today with the attention mask by doing an additive bias. But at least the, the main ones, relative position and uh, alibi. But there's Horace solicited some feedback on some of his discords. And there's other things that people may want to do that don't fit as cleanly. And the real, like the real benefit <clears throat> of doing all this is right now with the current API to actually do something called like like alibi, you'd have to realize a full attention mask. Um, and if your context lakes get very big, and so think. Claude and all the super long context lakes that say they capitalize on alibi um, position encoding, uh, you just blow up in memory. And it turns out um, like alibi and some of the things that people want to do are regular enough in pattern 
um, that you don't have to fully realize an attention mask. Um, and I have proof. I did this. I wrote this up in Triton and like, um, this is comparing alibi attention or comparing alibi versus the like naive way of fully realizing the attention mask and like a, it's way faster. Uh, B, um, when you get to very long sequence lengths, you're going to oom if you have to fully realize the attention mask where you don't necessarily have to. So this is a forward performance, pretty big numbers, uh, backward performance, still big, still the ooming. So this is the, this is the strong motivation, but it can be more generic. Um, and okay. So like the, the score mod, this is where I think it's sticky. It's essentially like what. How, how should we and can we update SDPA to allow for potentially an arbitrary callable um, function? I Maybe mean, not an arbitrary callable, but a function that accepts certain inputs that conform enough so that they could be fused into a Triton kernel. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know the best way to solicit feedback on this. Yeah, hand, I'll see that, I see the hand. Uh, one quick question: Do you, in in the ideal world, do you still need both the attention mask and the score modifications? Are there two different concepts, or is there a world where the two are redundant? This is a great, great question. Um, and like, I don't, I don't want both of them. Um, I, I, I can, or I, I can come a little bit. Like I, yeah. I think it's, it, it, I think it is totally possible for us to get away with only one like score modification that unifies the bias and the attention mask. Uh, there are some reasons we may want to have a, a separate attention mask, uh, either like function or uh, like, or, you know, perhaps also like accept a function. And so one of the reasons there is that. Um, the attention mask, like logically, is like a meaningfully different concept. Because one of the things the attention mask does is that it uh, allows you to know you don't need to compute this region of like uh, actual computation. And and so one thing you can imagine we do in the future um, is that you know we, we might want to kind of leverage this attention mask uh, either as like a function or something like that uh, for like block sparsity or uh, other kinds of things uh, like that. And, and so that that kind of does potentially make it like a meaningfully different concept uh, compared to score modification. Um, although, you know, like it, it is totally possible to implement uh, like attention masking through the score modification function uh, today. Uh, so it, it is perhaps reasonable to only have one, uh, although uh, I, I think it might be reasonable to justify having two. Yeah, I think like the fact that we have a causal flag is kind of like it's this could be an attention mask, but it turns out if you're explicit with some of these patterns, um, you can save on compute and people want performant things. So um, I think it's kind of insane. Oh. Right, but in in both cases, if you can save on compute, you want to do so, right? Even, even if your score modification is, you know you're gonna, not going to look at this value hopefully you will use that insight to not compute them, whether that's an attention mask specification or a score modification specification, right? I think that's a good segue into um, maybe the Horus side of things, which is like, how would, uh, I, I think the API is interesting, um, but it's like we would use inductor to essentially stamp out the templated version um, of the Triton kernel, which has a score mod injected in there. Um, and, uh, how would that would look and essentially like just keeping them separate, make it easier to do that or make it more, more feasible. Yeah. I'll, I'll show the, uh, I guess I'll share my screen. Uh, yeah. if you wanna... so like the proposed API here looks something like this, um, where, where basically the semantics here are that like. Uh, Q, K, uh, M, N, and H are all like scalar tensors, uh, where Q, K is like the current value of the score that you're computing. And then M, N, and H are all like uh, integer scalars that correspond to like, you know, your current position uh, in your like uh, attention score uh, that you've computed. And so, for example, you can imagine that like, you know, you can totally, so this is like, you know, how relative attention is implemented, right? You, you just like take the relative, you know, positions of, of the two uh, like 
uh, locations that you're looking at and you add it to your attention score. And then you can also implement like causal masking uh, through this. Um, but given a function like this, it's a little bit difficult to actually uh, know what you're masking out. You could imagine, uh, so like, you know, what, what I'm kind of imagining is that in, in the future, uh, what we might do is we might just uh, like pre-run uh, this like function that we're given uh, on like, you know, a, a grid of inputs and then know like what values we're going to be masking out, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and then once we like know what which values we're going to be masking out, uh, then we can like you know pass that into like a block sparse uh, trident kernel uh, or along those lines uh, to to actually uh, like allow us to skip doing that compute. Uh, but it's not so easy to actually uh, like take advantage of that uh, from within the function itself because like you're returning a value uh, which may or may not be negative inf, and that corresponds to whether it's masked out or not. Does that make sense, Selvin? Yes, it does. Thank you. So, like one thing, one thing you could imagine is like, oh, what we could do is uh, have like uh, the QK. Um, uh, we, we could have like the like we we could just have this kind of implicitly be our masking function, and then you know we we just like pass in you know garbage values or like you know. Uh, garbage values for QK or like all zeros or something. And then if it returns a negative inf, uh, then we, you know, pretend that it's masked out. And if it doesn't return negative inf, uh, then we, we say it's uh, not masked out. Um, so th th that's like a possibility. And, and that would allow us to unify these two uh, concepts. Uh, okay. And how would you stem that into your Triton kernel? Though? Yeah, so th that's a good question. And so uh, so this is kind of God, my VS code has been so laggy recently. Uh, whenever my VS code decides to move, I will be able to scroll. Um, so how, how that kind of looks like is actually I'll I'll just show you like how the like uh, how the Python API would look like and how the Trident code looks like. So for relative attention, this is how this is what the user would provide for like the relative attention, and this is what it looks like <laughs> in Trident code. Uh, so it, it's basically the same thing. Uh, and, and the reason why we can do this, uh, is kind of similar, uh, to like first class dims, uh, -y in some sense. Uh, but, but basically, uh, you, you can like write this code in PyTorch and this is a Trident code you actually need. Uh, and if you take a look at like where we, uh, stamp this in, uh, it just looks like this. So after you compute QK, you just pass in your like, you know, placeholder trident function uh, where you pass in like uh, the actual values and, you know, some offset values uh, and things like that. So like uh, we, we've kind of, uh, so uh, we've kind of already like demonstrated that this like works from the Triton cogen uh, side of things. Uh, and so the main aspects we're kind of missing now is, is we still need to uh, kind of plumb it through the rest of the stack. So. I didn't manage to finish doing this, but I did get a plump through like the high order operator side of things, uh, as well as like the inductor lowering. Uh, but I, I still need to add support for the inductor templates uh, to actually like automatically stamp out uh, this code. Uh, but I, I think intuitively uh, looking at like the PyTorch representation and the Trident representation, uh, this lowering is not like an immense, uh, not an immense feat. Ed? I have a sort of more mechanical question, which is, um, so right now we have support for epilog fusion for matrix yeah. multiply. Um, how similar or different is, uh, this, uh, sort of extensibility? It's a little bit different and it's kind of annoying. And like so, some of these things do break some of our, like, uh, thing, like we, we will need some other support on like the dynamo side for like power to operators. Um, and uh, we also need to modify the doctor templating system. Um, so yeah, t t today like the then doctor like templates are kind of hard coded for epilogue fusion, uh, so we kind of need to add support uh, to allow it to modify intermediate values. Um, but uh, like I I've been spending some time looking at it, and I think it's feasible, and ho hopefully shouldn't be like an immense amount of work. Joel. 
Hi, uh, is it too much to ask for um, the softmax activation to also be rolled into score modification or a separate abstraction? Because I think that would make this even more flexible to like alternate activation like sell you. Yeah, so we, we have kind of thought about that a little bit. I mean, it's uh, it's like possible, I guess, but it, it would require quite a bit of yeah or like and, and the reason it require quite a bit of changes is that like getting like in some sense like the softmax is actually like a significant majority of the actual like vectors math so to speak like all, all of this more or less is kind of about updating the softmax uh so we we could you know track that out and then you know put that into a template uh and, and something like that um but yeah i i, I think it, it could be reasonable but uh yeah, uh, I we we we, we could potentially do that. One question there, like, would you expect SDPA SDPA to accept a like activation um, input? Or right, so the main thing actually, I, so like, if you a command score mod <laughs> with the ability to just turn off the softmax, then then that that would give you what they want, uh, I think, because you you can just do the CLU and the score mod. Uh, and then you just need to get rid of the softmax stuff, uh, and, and I, I think that gives them their desired uh, API. Yeah. Yeah. NYC. Uh, yeah, I have a follow-up question here in terms of like more on the implementation side. On uh, it seems like you have to pipe a lot of things through the whole stack, in particular these custom function, and make sure it looks good. I'm curious, do you consider something like Having an open API for users to register new enum entries for SDPA. So, you know, if you have an activation enum, the user can register new things and they will just give you the Triton kernel stamp basically that you need. You don't need to pass that through the stack. Some people will register that directly to inductor. And yeah. if they want to make it work in C, they will have to modify our C kernel. Uh, we have, or uh, we did kind of consider this. Uh, I, I, I do think there's a couple of nice advantages of kind of plumbing through the stack, uh, which particularly, I, I think it, it will be, you know, kind of some amount of work, but I think we already have a lot of the infra in place. Like we, we have high order operator capture in Dynamo. Like we, we have it working through AOT Autograd. Uh, and so the main kind of aspects here are inductor uh, kind of uh, need to support like this kind of flexible template. Uh, cogen and, and I, I think that makes sense for us to support uh in general on the inductor side anyways uh so i i, I guess i would say i don't think this is like a massive like one-off uh, investment for this i i think we have most of the pieces in place already and the main part we need uh, in addition is something that i, I think makes sense or sorry actually <laughs> the main part uh, we, we would need is actually uh like even if we do have this kind of enum thing uh we would still probably want to use the same infrastructure in uh inductor uh, or like yeah. we, we don't need to build on the same infrastructure in Doctor unless we wanted like a completely different uh, templating system or something like that. Uh, but the other reason why I, I think it makes sense for us to kind of have a separate thing is that if you kind of look at like some of the use cases, so some of the use cases might be like they want to multiply it by like a heads array, and, and so this is like a separate buffer uh, outside of like what's passed in explicitly through the values that we would also want to lower down as like a separate input. So this is like kind of one, one example uh, thing for Alibi. Another example uh, situation uh, is that they uh, like they want to do like what they call like block detention. So it's like they have a single sequence that they're kind of computing attention over. Like it's kind of like packed together, and so they don't want like tokens that are from different sequences to interact with each other. And so their mask uh, looks like you know the typical causal mask with the additional condition uh, that like the two tokens need to be in the same segment. Um, and, and so this is not, uh, it's not so easy to like put this in like, like, like the way we would want to, like one, one thing we could do with like the current setup is we can automatically raise these to additional buffers that are being passed in, uh, through like the dynamo slash like, uh, inductor uh, stacks. And I, I think that ends up being like a, a pretty powerful, uh, a pretty powerful, like uh, additional, uh, semantics, uh, okay. And sure. the third thing here is that in many of these cases, actually, there is some amount of interaction with Autograd. Um, so bias is kind of a special case 
uh, where you are purely doing an additive modification to like the value that requires grad. Uh, and, and so that doesn't actually really require us to um, like compute a backwards pass. Um, but if you're doing a mask, uh, this does require us to uh, compute a backwards pass because you know it's like a multiplicative interaction uh, with like the gradient requiring thing. Uh, and, and so basically uh, like uh, kind of plumbing it through like Dynamo kind of allows us to like leverage like autograd uh, over these operators uh, as well, which, which I also think will be like a pretty uh, powerful uh, feature. Uh, and so actually, I'll say uh, a fourth a fourth reason why I, I think it's worth doing a torch ops uh, instead of trident ops, and that's that like it also allows us to like very easily fall back um, to like a uh, pytorch ops, for example, if it's like not supported, uh, while kind of a specific trident template kind of forces us into uh, only using trident. And so here, like you know, what we can do. All right, I, I wrote this with like higher uh, first class dims, but basically, like you know, if you kind of want to emulate the same. Uh, the same change using the API. All you need to do is you just need to, you know, have first class dims, and then do it uh, in, in this way, uh, and, and then this gives you the exact same results uh, as what the fused trident kernel would do with like the same uh, user provided function. Um, so, so basically, there's kind of like all these things that we can do uh, on top of like just the like lambda itself, and, and I think that justifies us uh, doing it uh, at the PyTorch level. And it is also one of the reasons why I, I think it's like very like wh why I think like PyTorch is like a very uniquely suited uh, level of the stack uh, to, to, to provide this kind of API. Sherlock, did you still have a question? No, like uh, Horace also already answered this to, uh, about the autograph question. So it feels like to me this is a custom app authoring problem, but you have you allow user to author this at two level. On the higher level, you have a touch level app, uh, and then you can allow autograph to work with it, but. Uh, in parallel, you also have a, a Triton level interface allow user to provide a lambda. Uh, but uh, you have an assumption that user understand inductor level IR and knows the uh, uh, knows like the, how how the lambda will fit into your template. Mm, or like the the user is writing PyTorch code, and we would translate that in, into Trident code. Oh, so we okay. Like or like the, the example here, kind of above, was like what the user writes, which is this code, like rel attention. Uh, and so you can see these are like PyTorch ops. Uh, like these these are like totally valid uh, PyTorch semantics, uh, where like cur or uh, like cur is like a scalar value, scalar tensor. And the M, N, and H are all a scalar integer tensors, uh, and, and so this is like totally valid uh, PyTorch uh, semantics or like PyTorch code. And the the Trident example is just like what we need to translate uh, the PyTorch uh, code into. And the reason for providing the Trident code is to show that this is not a particularly hard cogen problem <laughs> we're, we're dealing with here. Like the the, the like really like really all we need to do is we just need to be able to like kind of plumb these things uh, together. Uh, in a way that uh, works out. I, I do think that like um, like there are there's restrictions on what a user could provide that could be generated in Triton. Like if they did current equals torch and then my fancy module on the position um, on the indexes, like that probably won't be able to be Triton cogen. So like that's an interesting API question of like how do you how do you make the lambda generic and confined in the right way and and clean for people to figure out what's going on but yeah i i, I will say that i i kind of expect that like <laughs> like pretty much everything that people want to do is just like formalized operations and like loads uh and considering that like all of these values are current are like provided as scalar tensors i i think you'd really need to work hard uh to like provide a, a function uh that, that doesn't work <laughs> Uh, like you need to like expand it or uh, do something weird. I actually have a question about this. 
Horace, um, the, naively, the way I was imagining that this would work is that you would run regular decomps on these functions to get the translation. But it seems like you're implying that you just want to do a more direct translation. Oh, no, no, no. I, I would use just like the regular inductor lowering uh, process. OK, uh, which, which is overkill, right? Because these functions actually work for only scalar inputs. Right. Well, I mean, te technically, if you take a look at how I'm doing this now, uh, I'm not really actually running the full inductor lowering process. I kind of just uh, iterate over the graph and just call like lowerings, whatever, uh, and, and I get like a single computed buffer uh, out of it. Um, Which you have to because you don't want inductor to decide that it needs to uh, realize a buffer. Yeah, th this is kind of like a, a more general question where I can imagine with like larger points ops inductor might try to like uh, pr like realize a buffer or like cause issues there. Um, and and that, that might be somewhat annoying, but I, I think it's uh, uh, it's like not that bad of an issue. Any other questions, comments? Horace, what, what do you want uh, the takeaway to be slash what questions do you want answered? I think the main question is how, how do people feel about kind of introducing these kinds of APIs into the PyTorch, like uh, into PyTorch in general? And like in particular, like, you know, if this kind of like API works well and we've kind of proved it out, I could imagine that there are like many other cases like where we kind of might want to extend this kind of API. So for example, perhaps we, you know, later add kind of like quantized MATMLs, like, you know, like fused or like, you know, a particular dequant scheme uh, plus a MATML, um, you know, th these kinds of operators uh, in order to kind of, you know, guarantee that your like dequantization scheme is like fused uh, in into your MATML load uh, and things like that. And so th th this is kind of, you know, as kind of Driss points out, <laughs> We have no other like function. Uh, we, we have no other API in PyTorch that looks like this today. Uh, and so this is like a meaningfully different API uh, compared to any of the operators that we are providing today. And, and there are also other kind of like mm, things we need to figure out. So for example, like, you know, are we willing to always compile uh, with like inductor when, when we like hit, hit these kernels uh, and, and things like that? Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, the kind of the, the main thing I, I think we've kind of proved out is that I think we think it is technically feasible and we have most of the pieces in place in order to do this. And I think the big question now is, is this an API that we are kind of willing to provide? Uh, and to somewhat seed the conversation, like, yeah, my whole question during this is like, is this PyTorch Thonic? Like, is this, do we think users would like expect this API? And then Christian sent, pointed out to me that there is a function called torch apply underscore that does accept a callable. <laughs> That's the only thing in all of PyTorch, but. Joel? Uh, yeah, I have a minor thing on this syntax. So in the user code, you specify that M and N are scalars. Um, is it then reasonable to expect the user will use torch.where or would they just like access the values in some like ternary? It seems a little counterintuitive to uh, you. They are scalar tensors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or be, sorry, and to like, give like a, a more like intuitive reason why uh, I want them to be scalar tensors is that like we are defining the code in like a pointwise manner. But when you actually implement this code, we want to be able to like broadcast the pointwise value uh, into like a block uh, uh, of some kind. Uh, and, and so, like, technically, like, in Triton, if you kind of imagined uh, what this shape actually is, uh, it would be, like, M is equal to, uh, M is, like, a, like, mm -hmm. block M by one tensor. Uh, N is, like, a, you know, block, uh, one by block N. Uh, and then, like, cur is a, like, block M by uh, block N uh, value. Look at that uh, auto complete. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my VS Code is extremely laggy right now. I'm not sure why. I mean, it's a combination of screen share and whatever. So thank God for uh, auto complete. But yeah, yeah. So like that, that's kind of the, the the motivation behind this kind of API that's like very restrictive and a single element at a time. Is that like it, it makes it easy for us to like do this kind of broadcasting uh, to like the the necessary shapes uh, for like actual performance reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just 
you know, slightly worried that it'd be kind of strange for the user to think, oh, I have to use a where on these like scalar tensors. Um, but it's still minor concern. Christian? I think the uh, obvious kind of counter to all of this, right, is to say, hey, like, why can't we just use touch compile to pattern match and emit? I'm just bringing it up because I think someone will, and we should talk about it. Why can't we get the compiler and obviate the need for something like SDPA with some Lambda arguments and things like that to begin with? NYC, did you want to respond to that? No, oh, that was a pre-existing. Oh, okay. Um, I want to answer that. So it's kind of uh, not incompatible because uh, as you, as Horace showed, uh, like you can easily just implement this higher order operator as some regular PyTorch code. So if you uh, eventually show up with a pattern matcher that is sufficiently smart, you could just be like, okay, well, this higher order operator is just this Python code and uh, the pattern matcher gets it. So I, there, there's a there's a smooth ramp between these, in my opinion. We Have we tried that pattern matching? Because I have seen some code that does it. Uh, we have, although uh, it's a bit more restrictive because in this case, what you would need to do is you need to pattern match um, both the like essential bits of attention as well as an arbitrary like sled of uh, scalar. It's 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 kind of you know, it seems very reasonable to like All right. make people. So call this is, I, I guess I would argue two things. So the first one is that I actually think this API is easier to understand. <laughs> than like running out the masks uh, explicitly. Um, for example, this is kind of how rel attention would look like if you wrote it out manually. Uh, so it would be like an A range of M uh, viewed into like M comma one, an A range of N viewed into one comma N. Uh, and then you would need to make sure the bias is shaped in the correct way to add it to QK. But Horace, let's suppose people were writing their attentions in first class dims, which, we, which they should, because it's, it's way better. Uh, but like the thing is that like e even if they did write it in first class dims, like sorry, to be clear, <laughs> if they wrote it in first class dims, it would look exactly like this. Uh, like, th th like, like I, I literally translate from this to like the correct masking with first class dims, right? Like, uh, I, I literally like this is how you translate that function into the like a actual like non like non special lambda version. Is you use first class dims, you like do the appropriate broadcasting. Uh, and this is kind of how it looks like. No, but but Christian's uh, point is that then you don't you don't need ma you don't need an attention higher to op if you can pattern match that then. Well, you yeah, can just... but like I guess my point is that like this is a lot harder to pattern match, and I, I think there are like pretty trivial modifications of this that make it way harder <laughs> to pattern match. So l let's say like you know you like wrote it like one comma m, and then you wrote it like you know n comma one. And then you know all, all of a sudden now you're adding in plus like bias dot view dot trans or like bias dot transpose or something uh, dot view, you know all, all all of a sudden this uh, I think turns into a pretty intractable uh, like pattern matching task. Uh, so like it, it's basically like if you give people like the rope to hang themselves, i.e. like an actual full tensor, uh, it, it's a lot easier for people to write code that we, we either are unable to pattern match or is like fundamentally unpattern matchable. Um, Greg? Oh, um, my question was about the contract. I think I'm missing something maybe. Like on one hand, I heard uh, you could use this to like guarantee that Triton will fuse it. On another hand, I heard like uh, you want to use Torch Ops because you want to be able to like fall back. Is that a different part of the APIs? Like, or is the contract well defined? I, I don't quite get that part. Yeah, so this is a good question. Uh, I think there's a couple different things. So first one is just like, you know, we support a lot of hardware <laughs> in principle, and you don't want people to like write code that then uh, like, you know, doesn't work when they port it to CPUs or, you know, so, some other accelerator. And and so at the very minimum, we need, we should provide like a fallback so that if it's running on some hardware that Triton doesn't support, um, like it, it's not fused. Um, the other thing is that Triton is like fundamentally still kind of like limited 
Um, it, it's kind of like a similar thing, I guess. Chris can probably talk more about like scale top rocket extension. Like, you know, like, you know, I think pe people mostly use scale top rocket extension because they want the fused kernel. Uh, but it's still useful to provide the math op because people run into all sorts of weird cases where you're kind of forced uh, in into using it for one reason or another. So the mental model is like, sorry, the mental model is like, it will probably fuse if I'm not doing something on like weird hardware or something like that. Is that how I should think about it? Or like the way I think, yeah, is that like, it's guaranteed to fuse like in our happy case, but like, you know, we don't want to provide an API that relies on Triton in order to have like the correct semantics. Um, and, and so it, it's uh, th th that's why I think it's important to be able to like easily. I think that. that plus the actual like Triton template is based off like the flash attention template, and that itself has restrictions. All of the SDPA kernels have restrictions of these kernels. So I like the goal for there is like best effort, but provi provide mechanisms so that you can assure it's fused, and if not, figure out why. How, what are those mechanisms? Uh, right now in SCPA, it's a context manager that lets you like turn off the math fallback and the fuse kernels will tell you why we can't run them. Um, I see. Okay. Christian? Does it make sense yet at this point to talk a bit about how this would work as a native function and with things like, you know, script and export and so on and so forth? Um... I guess short answer, it won't work with Torch script. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, like, I think we can export this. Like, I don't know if I have. It'll be in higher uh, order op. So same same yeah. playbook as TorchCon. Yeah, and, and it is possible for us like to kind of decompose it into uh, back into like a, a regular native function.yaml uh, if you don't necessarily want it as like a fused uh, representation. Um, Yeah. Okay, I... I'm pushing the agenda along. Thanks, Horace and Driss, for a fascinating convo. Okay. Uh, so for our next part, um, it's not really uh, that baked. So the, the purpose of here is just to get some initial reactions and feedback about um, torch bind in PD2. Is this the correct screen? Am I sharing my right screen? No. This is not. Give me a sec. Okay, so I have I have motivation in the very 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 crappy implementation sketch. So the motivation behind Torchbind for PD two, um, and if that doesn't mean anything, that's fine. Like just just focus on the motivation. Is um, when I talk to people like Michael Swo who are trying to like bring PD2 to our production use cases. Um, there's this thing where it's basically like, hey, PD2 is all about you know, tensor compute only, but actually there's tons of other stuff that you wanna do. And we don't, uh, we just don't have any provision for that, right? Like pre-processing, tokenization, beam search. Ever seen a GitHub issue where someone's like, hey, I tried to torch compile a function. It took in a list of strings and it didn't work. It, it tried to specialize every time. How come? And our answer is, well, it's cause you know, PD2 only works with tensor inputs. So you can't give us a list of strings. And um, the like sort of PD2 party line in this situation is, hey, we don't support this. You need to figure something else out. You know, get get some tensors and then call to call us, and everything will be great. But there are some problems with this stance. So problem one is if you're doing export, um, you probably do want this pre-processing code or this tokenization code. Like it's an important part of the pipeline. And if you just say, well, PD2 export doesn't handle this at all, then you're basically begging for someone to build another system, you know, wrapping up your export thing that handles these things. And so the, there, there isn't really any, uh, there's conservation of complexity. Like someone has to deal with it somewhere. And um, the thing is that like uh, oftentimes the patterns you need for this code, it's not that complicated. Like you don't need a full fledged general purpose programming language. You just need a way to like do some extern calls every once in a while um, so that you can get in tensors or feed out tensors somewhere else. 
And the second problem is that uh, when we look at uh, some modeling situations, we often end up in this, in this situation where we have these uh, we have these things that are like sort of like tensors, but not exactly like tensors, and are ca causing problems for our stack. So one of the ones that we recently have been talking about is a keyed jagged tensor from Torchrec. Um, so the like short explanation for what key jagged tensor is is imagine you're building a recommendation system, and uh, you know like when you're trying to do a recommendation to someone, uh, there's going to be a bunch of like features that like describe various aspects of you know the user or the thing you're trying to recommend, and you're, you'll have you're going to have lots and lots of these, and they're going to be sparse. So some of them will be relevant, some of them won't be relevant. And you need some representation to like jam them all together. And so key jagged tensor is like, hey, um, given some list of features, I will give you a bunch of tensors um, that are jagged and uh, like have the um, have the information about the things you're interested in. And this is um, a bit of a pain for Torch compile, because um, well. It just, uh, what's the word? So there are a few things going on here, but one thing that's going on here is that um, like key jagged tensor is this thing. It contains some tensors, but it also contains a bunch of other stuff, like lists of strings and lists of ints. And um, sort of, if you just try to like use torch compile as it exists today on compute that's using key jagged tensor, it sort of blows up in very amusing ways. So we're gonna have another discussion in the next meeting after this, not live stream, sorry, um, about like what exactly to do about the general torch compile problem. But sort of the, the gist of the problem here is that there are things like objects that are not tensors that your tensor code may want to interact with because like with a key jagged tensor, eventually you pull it and you get out a dense tensor, and you can do your regular dense compute on it. So you, it needs to interact with the tensor code, and it's useful to like you know if you're like trying to export, you you do need this stuff in your pipeline, but it's just not a tensor. And like you know what are you gonna do, right? You just have no provision for dealing with this because PD two is like tensors only. Any questions about the motivation? or arguments, or like, no, Ed, like, I disagree. OK, so let, let's just describe a little bit about the idea, because maybe that'll um, kick off some discussion. So way back in the day, uh, when TorchScript was a thing, uh, we added this feature to TorchScript called TorchBind. And uh, the motivation behind TorchBind was this. Uh, TorScript is cool. You can you know, put programs in it that do tensor compute, but people have random objects and they want to be able to like also run them from their TorchScript programs. So what TorchBind did was it said, okay, you can define a class in C++ and you TorchBind it, similar to PyBind, where now this class is accessible from Python, but this class is also usable from TorchScript. So now in your TorchScript programs, you can have things that create these torch binded objects, call methods on them, and these can be part of the overall torch script package that you have. So torch bind for PD2 is basically like, hey, you know, torch bind, you know, kind of a good idea because it basically is this get out of uh, jail free card whenever someone comes to you and is like, hey, Ed, I want to put this thing that is not a tensor in my graph. Can I do something? You just say, go away, torch bind your thing, do it. So what concretely is the proposal? So uh, we're going to modify Dynamo so that if you create TorchBind classes or call methods on them, we will capture them into the Dynamo FX graph. Now, there is a problem with doing this. The problem with doing this is that uh, you know Dynamo needs to know things about functions to be able to chase through them, right? Like it needs to like create the variable trackers and be able to answer questions like you know did this return a two or a five or whatever. So in order to be able to symbolic trace, um, we will introduce a concept of a fake version of a TorchBind class, right? So you have to, f it's just like tensors, right? You can fakeify a tensor into a fake tensor. You fakeify a TorchBind class into a fake TorchBind class. And you need to be able to do all the operations you did on the original class on the fake class 
If you have methods on it, those methods need to, you know, produce fake tensors. And then Dynamo uses the fake version of the torch bind class to, you know, go ahead and do its actual tracing. So it's able to answer questions like you call this method and you did an if statement on it. What does the if statement return? Well, the fake, uh, the fake torch bind class answers that question. You also implement guards this way because, um, you basically just say, well, the data in the fake version is exactly what you need to guard on. It needs to be the same the next time around because that's what we uh, made specializations on. And then, uh, and then you just put them in the graph and then something happens. Like uh, this part is a little bit, I'm not sure. Uh, one thing is it seems like we probably want to keep Torchbind operations in the same order. So you need control flow dependencies between them so they don't get reordered. Um, that's something we've talked about before in PyTorch 2, and it's probably okay. Sorry, we yep. need this because we're not saying that they have to be immutable? Yeah, because I'm I'm terrified of saying that Torchbind classes have to be immutable. Mm, okay. I just I just don't know how I'm going to enforce this. Like, So if, if we want to go the immutability route, so let's put that down as a note, then I need, I, I basically think I need to redesign Torchbind where I need to like have a data description language like Python data classes that prevents you from putting mutable crap in. Like, like I need some enforcement. I mean, I guess you could also just have a knob that says uh, pretty please, it's immutable. But I would not want that knob not, not to be default. You, you would have to explicitly say so. Uh, Rodrigo. How about when they mutate tensors? Uh, oh. How about when we mutate tensors? Yeah, like for example, a process group is torch bind, binded. And it mutates the tensors that it takes as arguments. Yeah, so I believe um, the way torch script dealt with this was you still had to write uh, schema annotations and the process group, uh, those operations said, hey, I mutate these tensors. Am I correct? So, uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about like what exactly to do about AOT Autograd. So one problem with AOT Autograd is that um, after you run AOT Autograd, you end up with a functionalized graph. So I'm not really sure what to do about these torchbind uh, torch operators in this regime. So one thing I could say is, nah, like you, you don't get to pass torchbind operations to AOT Autograd. AOT Autograd is about tensors, right? So what you're going to do is you got a graph, a Dynamo FX graph. It's got some torchbind operations and some uh, regular tensor operations, and you're going to partition it up. And then the partitions that are tensor operations, you can send to AOT Autograd. And the non-partitioned uh, uh, torch bind operations, they just sort of hang out. And so essentially, you've ended up doing this two-level system where the top level knows how to do torch bind things. And then it calls into a lower level that knows how to do tensory things. So that's one way you could set it up. So we had a side discussion about this, like KJT, if the values tensor in the KJT participates in a, a function, you know, with a weight that requires grad. So say I do like a embedding lookup uh, and that how that won't really work with AOT auto grad. Um, how can we represent something like that in training? Uh, so so there's two strategies. So strategy one is you do the partitioning before AOT Autograd. And so now, as long as your Torchbind class, like, you know, properly sets up GradFun because it's just calling regular PyTorch APIs under the hood, then you're fine, right? Because Autograd will stitch up things that know how to do Autograd and things that don't know how to do Autograd. If you don't want to do that, and you want to actually compile through it, then, uh, and this is why I'm a little, uh, there's some question marks here for KJT, 
which is the other thing you can do is KJT does contain tensors. So you could say, hey, I do want to, I do want to actually have my compiler be able to see these tensors. So the tensors don't get put in the torchbind class. And essentially you have this model where the torchbind class is just the, you know, extra data that can't conveniently be um, uh, modeled with tensors. NYC. Uh, just a quick clarification on the KJT example in particular. Do you expect that class to be passed all the way to the back end? Or do we expect it to disappear somewhere in the middle of the compile? Yeah, stack? let's talk a little bit about key jagged tensor lifetime. So the model, as Michael tells me, is that key jagged tensor is something that gets fed to you by the data loading process because you know it, it is representing the sparse features which you've like looked up from like a database somewhere. Um, you do a bunch of stuff. Uh, some in like uh, today's architectures, you usually end up doing a pooling operation, squashing out the sparsity. So you have a bunch of dense tensors, and then you go from the sparse architecture to the dense architecture, and you just have normal tensor compute. But there's also like you know modeling improvements where people sort of keep the key jagged tensor around so that like you know some of what you traditionally think of as dense compute actually is still operating on key jagged tensors. Uh, I didn't answer your question. Your question was, does the key jagged tensor show up all the way in the back end in inductor? And my answer to that is uh, no, not obviously. Because um, like at the end of the day, it's a bunch of tensors. Like a key jagged tensor is a bunch of tensors. So you know the obvious uh, way to integrate it with a compiler stack is to just have the compiler see a bunch of tensors and uh, work out what to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then what is the benefit of having this class in C++ and torch binding them compared to having them in pure Python? Yeah, so it, it key jack tensor is not a perfect, um, perfect match for the torch bind use case. But uh, if you have it in C++ and essentially the, the point is that like you've got some stuff and your compiler stack can't deal with it. So you move it to C++, you bind it up so you can call it from your model code. And then when someone wants to deploy your stuff, they can just deploy a bunch of calls into your Torchbind APIs, which are already in C++, and then you get a C++ inference environment only, right? Because you've like cut out all the Python stuff. If you're able to compile through KJT entirely, then you don't have to do this, and you just end up with like a lot of tensors. But you know, th and this is the discussion we've been having internally. KGT, you end up with a lot of tensors. Like you know, like you're talking hundreds of features uh, for these for these models. Mind Chow? Yeah, I was curious. The uh, so uh, after say say we have torch bounded the uh, for example KJT if KJT in C plus plus and then we do torch compile on it and. Then, after AOD Autograd, are we ha still having the KJT representation, or is by that time it's still dense tensor compute? I no, guess. you all. You, so when you do the torch find route, you're saying I'm giving up on the compiler, doing anything with it. This is my get out of jail free card. I am. I've got some stuff that I can't compile or I don't want to compile, and I'm just sort of lifting it out and like uh, sidestepping PD2. But unlike the normal PD2 stance, which is that, like, well, we graph break and you just have some code running in Python and not. The torch binding classes, one, can be exported and two, uh, let you, you know, still put everything into a single graph instead of having to graph break. I see. Is there another question from NYC? No, sorry. So okay. the, the torch yeah, binding, okay, this is one question, I guess, but torch binding doesn't save you from the million tensor problem. No, like if it you doesn't. Have to, you, you, would, okay. you would have to torch bind, which is why I'm like, uh, let, let's focus on bullet one, I think. Um, bullet oh. two is kind of, I'm not, eh, it's not perfect. I think we need to grill this uh, KJT problem some more. Mm-hmm. 
I want a temperature check from the room because I, I like this is about as much work as I've done. I, I like thought about it. I wrote some ideas down. Um, I don't think this is too much work to do, but I'm also not sure if we should do it. Like, is it kind of like, eh, it seems logical, whatever, or, eh, no, I don't know. Like, can I get some smileys, emojis, thumbs up, thumbs down? The, the autograph part feels pretty sketchy to me from what I heard. Uh... I'll come in to say that we probably need some way of handling KJT. Like it could be through Torchbind, it could be through tracing directly. I don't really know. Uh, but like, I don't think it's really optional <laughs> if we want to be able to use PT2 for some of the like inference use cases, right? Um, the other Torch, like Torchbind generically for non KJT use cases, the principal use case that I know about is preproc, where we Torchbind a uh, like a Kosky data frame, and that allows us to kind of um, uh, to to do the the preproc inside. But I don't know if that's um, we. There's maybe an alternative way of doing that or something. So to me, I think the major thing is like handling sparse features well uh, and capturing them in the graph is really really important for PT two. But it doesn't have to be through Torchbind, I suppose. NYC. I, I know we're over. Uh, I just have a question. It, so with the thing that you, after getting rid of all that red highlighted stuff, do we ever run things not in an exported environment? Uh, well, training is not exported. Uh, I don't know for inference. Do we do inference? I don't, I don't think we have any, like, no. yeah, we don't have any in Python inference. Gen AI, but they don't use PT2, so. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you all next week.